Hello, I'm Josh Lohman and welcome to Alaska Filmmakers, a series dedicated to exploring the many talented individuals in the Alaska film community. Since 2005, writer-director Andrew McLean and producer Kara Marcus have been showcasing their talents at the Sundance Film Festival. First in 2005 with their documentary, When the Season is Good, Artists of Arctic Alaska, followed by their 2008 short film, Sukumi. Then in 2011, the two filmmakers returned to Sundance with their first feature film, On the Ice. Each of these films shares the unique quality of being shot right here in Alaska. In today's episode, D.K. Johnson sits down with Andrew and Kara to speak about their journey into filmmaking in this special extended edition of Alaska Filmmakers. Well, Andrew, Kara, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll just start with the basic questions. Uh, how you, each of you got, got started in filmmaking? I'll start with you, Andrew. Okay. Uh, I was in theater before I was in film. I uh, lived in Seattle for a while in my 20s and uh, started a, a theater company down there and then I moved back home up to Barrow and uh, along with a cousin of mine started a theater company in Barrow uh, and that was great. I was enjoying living at home and, and, and you know making stuff up there but then started thinking like it's a bit of a limited audience base you know doing uh, shows uh, just for like relatives and you know maybe 400 people from town and then that's it so I started thinking about film uh, you know as a way to be able to tell stories that were important to me and reflective of who I am and where I'm from and and still be able to reach a wider audience uh, and so I just decided to apply to film school uh, I had no film experience at all I'd never even seen a, a film production camera and applied to like UCLA and Columbia and NYU and I got into I got into all three but NYU offered a scholarship so I ended up there and that was about 10 years ago and I've been in New York since then and uh, working on on films of various sizes most of the films are either entirely or partially shot up here in Alaska and yeah and then now on the ice it's a it's my first feature film so you, you came back up here to do most of, most of your shorts and projects during school, or did you? Yeah. Okay. With yeah. one real exception. Yeah, yeah. one, yeah, Such kind of one day. exception. Just the, the very first thing that I made there was uh, entirely shot in New York. Everything else was either partly or entirely shot in Alaska. There was one, um, it was almost all of it was shot in New York, but I went back up to, to Barrow and shot, uh, I think, like six or seven shots. Uh, in Barrow for it as like one person's um, kind of POV was uh, in the Arctic. And Kara, how'd you get started? I also started in theater, um, but I was mostly a writer and an actor. And then when I graduated from college, I was acting and then I wanted to sort of learn a little bit more about producing and got a job working for Ben Barinholtz, who is a pretty acclaimed independent producer. He produced Miller's Crossing and Barton Fink and he distributed Blood Simple and he's a really fantastic guy and uh, so I started working for him and learned by doing through my relationship with him and his projects and then Andrew and I met and decided to do a documentary together and that was my first sole producer credit so and then we've gone from there and we've made a bunch of projects together. So you guys, uh, did you guys both work, get to work in theater together? No, no, we've never done, we've never done, I've actually never th seen any, any of this theater work. He's seen one of my plays. Yeah. By the time I moved to New York and started film, uh, film school, I kind of left theater behind to a certain degree. I've done a little bit since then. I acted in a uh, uh, production of Macbeth that was through Perseverance. It was uh, Tlingit Macbeth, done all in Tlingit that we did down in uh, Washington, D.C. But that's it, and it was kind of like a, not a vacation, I guess, but just, you know, just something a little different that I did. But really, it's, it's just been film for me for the past 10 years. Now you think, I just kind of wanted to touch on a little bit with you, what you guys' opinion on is on kind of a, film school or not film school? Like, you know, because you, you, went, you went to NYU, which is one of the more prestigious uh, known film schools here in the United States. Like, do you think that that, but what do you think the benefits of going to the school are as opposed to just trying to do it as an independent filmmaker? I think it was a great thing for me to do. Uh, I, I, I can see being different person by person. Um, you know, the weaknesses I had was that I knew nothing about 
actually like making a film, the hands-on process of it. Like I said, I'd never seen a film camera before, had no idea uh, how to cut shots together, uh, you know, didn't know simple things like, you know, the line, um, didn't know anything about uh, sound. Uh, and NYU was great at giving that kind of technical grounding and kind of teaching a cinematic language to something. I had experience in theater, which gave me experience with writing and especially with acting and directing actors. Um, I didn't really need that so much from school, and, uh, and which was good. They weren't that great at, at teaching that, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so it really helped me. Just the knowledge base of that helped me a lot. Uh, but then I think probably the most valuable aspect of it for me was the network of people that you get introduced to. I um, went to, was lucky enough to go to school with a bunch of really talented, some very cool people and we're still very close and we still work with each other and uh, um, help each other out. And I think that that is an incredibly important aspect of it. You know, film is a communal undertaking. You, you don't make a film by yourself. Uh, and to have a, a core group of people that you can go to, you can ask for help uh, or even just ask for opinions, ask for, for feedback on a script, things like that can be really incredibly valuable. And then it's also, it's dedicated time. You know, a lot of people want to start making films, but they're, they're working, uh, you know, full-time jobs, um, and it can be really difficult to carve out the kind of space you need in your life to do that. And film school, at the very least, if nothing else, it's like, all right, for the next you know, three or five years, you're making films and that's it. You're racking up a huge amount of debt, but you're making films and you, you get out of it with some things to show. And I was lucky enough that, uh, you know, the films that I made while at school did well. The, the short film Sikumi, which was the, my thesis film, got out there in 2008. It did really well, went to Sundance and it won the, the jury prize at Sundance and that kind of opened doors for me to be able to get uh, a feature made. So it, the process of it really worked for me, and maybe I'm maybe I got lucky in that respect. But um, you know, I think that's other people it might not work so well for. It's it's, it's if hard they have to a say. different skill set or yeah. yeah. There's you know there's if you talk to filmmakers, one of the things I've noticed is that every person who makes it in the industry or, or is able to uh, become a, a filmmaker and make a go of it, make, make a success of it. Every single person has a different path. There is no like, well, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you, you just got to kind of find your own way. Something we try to promote, <laughs> yeah. promote here, promoting on the series is the different avenues that, different, that filmmakers take now. Yeah. With You mentioned this a little bit already, but uh, your experience in theater, how did, that, how did I think that kind of helped you when you kind of transitioned over to film? Mm -hmm. What about you, Kara? For me, it was hugely important because through theater, I've learned how to have that group, productive, collaborative relationship where you actually make something as a group in a way that's supportive and challenging and productive as opposed to sort of like confusing and, and uh, unsatisfying. So I think through theater, I learned the way that I like to work um, and uh, sort of came to understand the development process. I think that it's through theater that I understand how to develop a script and characters and story. And also being an actor, obviously, that like influenced my understanding of character and scripts quite a bit. Um, but, you know, there's obviously like some pretty significant differences. So I think it was a huge part of why I was able to do what I've done. But I think it's also like there's been a learning curve, and that's why I sort of after school was like, you know what, I think I need to learn actually about like how films get made as well. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do both. And then Andrew, uh, so you were in the major for, for specifically for directing at, at NYU. Was there yeah. was that was that the goal from the from the beginning, or did you? Yeah, definitely. It's a writer director based program, uh, and that's really what I was interested in doing. That's kind of what I've been doing in in theater as well. I'd been uh, writing plays for a little while and was directing and doing a little bit of producing plays and then occasionally acting but really like directing was was really where I saw myself and really what I still see myself as is primarily a director um, I do you know I've, I've written almost everything that I've directed 
So I, you know, I have to consider myself a writer as well, but I think that like, I started writing in order to have things to direct. Uh, and I think it, it's still the part that I like the most and the part that I feel the most comfortable with. Now, what was the first film you guys worked on together? It was uh, a documentary. It was called When the Season is Good. Um, profiles of four different Alaska Native artists from the Bering Straits up into the Arctic region. And then, uh, so Sakumi was your, your thesis film, you said. Um, so how did that come about? Where'd that story come from? That's, it was an interesting uh, writing experience. I was, uh, obviously I had to make a thesis film and so I was gonna be writing a film. I wanted it to be set up in, in Alaska in the Arctic and I had started work on a script based on an event from my grandfather's life. Um, and that script was going nowhere. It was like <laughs> He writing was very was frustrated. <laughs> really, really a painful process. And just as an exercise while writing that script, in, in a class, uh, uh, one of the writing instructors gave me an assignment to take some of the characters from that and put them in an unexpected situation. And so I did that and just over the course, just like one night, the film just popped into my head. All right, all right, I'll take that. The main character in that is actually based on my grandfather and said, all right, well, what would happen if he witnessed a murder? How would he handle that? And that's basically where it came from. He had like a three page exercise for class and after he was sort of like, what do you, I wrote this thing, what do you think of this? Mm -hmm. I think this, there might be something to it, what do you think of it? Because we were trying to get the thesis thing going and yeah. we had a certain amount of grant money that we wanted to use and needed to use within an amount of time and I was like, no, I think there's something to it. And mm -hmm. then he yeah. kept writing and then it was like, I don't know, nine pages maybe? Yeah, tops. something like that, yeah. yeah. And when you decided to shoot it in Alaska, had you been up here before? Yeah, because when the season is good, we shot all over Alaska, so for like three months. So I had seen a lot of Alaska because that documentary took us to so many places. So you been, had you experienced both summer and winter at that point? Uh, yes, I had experienced both summer and winter, but I hadn't shot on the ice. It was the first time shooting on the ice with Sikumi. Now, it was, it was supposed to be set, you said, in the, the 1950s? Yeah, Sikumi is a period piece. It's set back in the time when my grandfather was a... Uh, um, a young man or, or you know in his 20s or 30s and uh, and so that's the the time when they were you know using binoculars and rifles and th and those sorts of things but they were still using dog teams as a, a way to get around and so that's why in Sikumi there's you know they're driving dog sleds. Now how was it finding crew for the film? Uh, that was the the crew were all my classmates. So you brought them up here. Yeah, yeah. brought them up here. That's uh, you must have been the popular director. Yeah, it's kind of nice actually. You know, making uh, films up in Alaska, it's an easy sell to get crew members. Everybody wants to come and see Alaska. Everybody wants to have that experience. So it was nice. Uh, just got together friends of mine and I'd worked on all of their films and, and we brought them up here. We it did was have kind of like the dream. dream. It yeah. was like 10 of our best friends yeah. coming and being, let's make something. And we actually yeah. got to make it. And yeah. we actually had like a little bit of money to do it. Yeah. Nobody was paid or anything, but. Yeah, the feature was, didn't, uh, didn't work that way. We didn't have, no. like it wasn't our friends working on it. It was a more professional situation and yeah. a professional crew. So we had to hire people and, uh, but that's still, it still was uh, true that it was easy to get people. People wanted to come and work on it. They wanted to have this experience. They want to see what Barrow, the Arctic is like. Right, it was, it was a good a thing plus, we had that yeah. on our side because we were paying very lame, yeah. lame <laughs> salaries. Well. So it was like, the trip was the payment, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about it on the ice. How did that come about? That uh, was based uh, primarily on the short. That's where it started. I started writing it right after Sundance back in 2008. I'd been telling people while I was at the festival, I was like, oh yeah, you know, I've got this feature, it's like half done. I'm, and then I went home and started writing it. Uh, and I was interested, you know, I was still interested in the story, in the um, things about like the response to violence, an individual's response to violence. And then I wanted to expand it and take a look at like how it affects the community and I wanted to make a, something contemporary, and so that's why I started to change it. Uh, it's not set back in the, in the 1950s or 60s like Sikumi is. It's set present day, and uh, the main characters are, they're not adult men, they're 17 year old, 17, 18 year old kids. And I did that because I was interested in how young people in Barrow, in, in towns all across the Arctic really, they're forming their identities now. 
because they're so connected to the wide popular culture that's everywhere in the world. There's kind of a homogeneity to the world in, in that sense. You know, you go anywhere and you can download uh, any song and you can watch any YouTube clip, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, and so these kids are, that are up there, they're really into hip hop. They're really finding a lot of their identity in, in sources like that. But at the same time, they're very connected to their own traditions and to culture that, that goes back for thousands of years up there. And I just think it's a really interesting mix of, uh, of places to, to draw your identity from. And so that's why I, I made that change. And those were the primary ingredients, I guess, as I started writing it. Now, let's uh, tell me a little bit about the inspiration came from, because it's the, the two, you said there's the two 17, 18-year-old boys yeah. with the two main characters. Where did the inspiration for those come from? The main character of the, the feature uh, is a kid named Kali, and he is a version of the main character of Sikumi, who is Apuna, who is based on my grandfather. So <laughs> in, in this weird sort of way, <laughs> This, the main character of the film is like is still kind of based on my grandfather. It's a modern it's day an idea, yeah. uh, teenage of, grandpa. Exactly, <laughs> of like what my oppa, what my grandfather would be like if he was a 17-year-old kid in Barrow today. So it's a very strange. It's and a then, journey. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, the, the characters are also based on people you know and people that you, uh, that, that I've seen and... and uh, you know, there's like real world inspiration for some of the characters in there, definitely. You're gonna be waiting a long time. What? The sun doesn't set till August. <laughs> Thanks for the info. Finally got the rest of our lumber. We can finish our shed this weekend. We're gonna go out. Where? Out on the ice. Where are we going? Down the coast? I say we just go down past the runway, man. No, no, dude, there's cracks over there. What, you scared? He fell through the ice. We had some fog. We didn't see the crack. Everybody keeps asking me, man, what happened? I just want this to be over. What did you see out there? Where's my son? I've been out all day looking for the body of your friend. You have to help him. He loves you so much. They can't find out what we did. Get the hell out of here! I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. Everybody's so freaked. They think he drowned. What the hell happened? That's my knife, man! What did you get my son into? I didn't mean to. What did you do? Now you're out of film school when you're doing this, so what are some of the challenges you get? Because you had to raise money for this, yeah. as opposed to having uh, you know, film school grants and equipment set aside. So what, what was the process of getting that raised? That was my job. And uh, the process was a long process. Initially, because we knew we were going to make the film with non-actors, we knew that was sort of a challenge in terms of getting investors to sign on. And so my strategy was to raise as much money as I could from grants and in-kind donations, so money that didn't need to be recouped, so that I could go to investors and say, here's this project that we've developed um, in an intensive way, and I've raised X amount of dollars that, you, that we never have to make back, that you're just getting as a 
as a bonus. So basically, you know, you're getting a production value of this amount, but you're only having to pay this amount. And so it was a significant amount of money. I raised probably about $300,000 in grants and in-kind donations. To be able to go to an investor and show them that that many people believed in the project enough to give or be involved to the degree of $300,000 is persuasive. And then the other thing that was very persuasive was the strength of Andrew's script, and we were sending them Sikumi. So we're sending them a short film that won Sundance, a great script, and $300,000 that they're never going to have to make back. So that was the only way we thought we could get over the obstacle of having non-actors. It's that hard to actually get investors to come on to support something like this from a place that they have no conception of and there's like very little population that would really that they believe would really buy tickets you know it was a hard sell so then I went and was a part of the Sundance creative producing lab in the summer of 2009 and one of my advisors was a producer named Lynette Howell who had made I think about nine films at that point she made Half Nelson was probably her most known film at that point She's since then made Blue Valentine, which was a, a big success and some other films. But um, she and I hit it off at Sundance, and she said that she, you know, listen, I, I have some contacts that I think might be interested in this project. Let me come on and help you um, try to get the rest of what you need. And so we started working together in September of 2009, and we were on set um, for prep. We were like there in Barrow for prep by February. So she really helped us finish out raising the rest of the money that we needed. Yeah. And there was uh, some things like some of the grant money that came in, the early grant money was really helpful in things like casting. Oh, yeah. You know, we got a big grant from the Princess Grace USA Foundation yeah. that covered a casting trip for us before we had any other money. Princess Grace, who had given him a student grant at NYU, which right. funded Sikumi. Yeah. So we had this relationship with them, and we went back to them and said, yeah this is what we're trying to do now, and they ended up supporting us. And what that did, that let us go all over the Arctic and, and find people that we thought were a good candidate, good candidates for, uh, for the cast. Because uh, like she said, we knew we were casting non-actors, and there was a real question as to whether or not we were going to be able to find people who could do it. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the, you know, the casting process, we had this core group of people we could say, with confidence, like we know we have people who can pull this off. We know we have actors to go to, and because we, we were that ready, if we we went to any of the uh, the investors, and yeah. that was a big help. We were ready, though, if we hadn't found someone to say, call it off, and actually, yeah. not do it. Yeah, if we didn't find the actors, we were we were gonna call it off. And then I think also you have to say that the one of the big, uh, very helpful part of getting it. Uh, made and getting investors involved was the uh, the tax incentive. Was, oh, yeah. Huge, yeah. That was actually huge for us in getting our biggest investor mm -hmm. because that, that investor was getting the rebate back and he knew, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this much, but I know I'm getting half of it back from the credit. So it was less of a risk for him. I don't, I don't think he would have, I don't know if he would have come on if, if he hadn't had that. Yeah, the film, it, the film never would have happened without the, the incentive. Was that kind of a, uh, a big uh, factor in you wanting to shoot the film, or even really make the film up here at all, or make a, a feature film up here? Was we the never kind of considered anywhere else. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's it wasn't. I mean, I've wanted to make the the film up here. I've wanted to make films up here, you know, since I decided to become a filmmaker. But it changed the environment. It changed uh, the possibilities of it. I don't think that we would have found investors without the tax incentive. Um, and so, you know, maybe we would have tried to make it or the film or something like it for a significantly smaller budget, but I think probably <laughs> most likely it just wouldn't have happened. Yeah, we made it for as little as we possibly could. Like, I don't know yeah. how we could have. Yeah, it was tight. Yeah. <laughs> what was the budget in the end, if you don't mind me asking? It was just under a million, um, which sounds like a lot to people, but it's really not. That includes all of post production. And did you shoot digital or 35 millimeter? We shot 35, we shot two perf 35, which is uh, you modify a normal 35 millimeter camera so that it's only shooting an image on half of the frame. And so one frame will, will become two images. So you get twice as much. Yeah, and it and locks you into uh, a 235 aspect ratio. So you're, you're in, you know, you're in scope and then 
Um, it's, it's really uh, nice and wide, but we wanted that anyway. So. Yeah. No, uh, uh, you mentioned in the in the online interview we did earlier this summer uh, that the, the script you kind of went through the uh, the Sundance Institute uh, and kind of worked with them on that. Tell us a little bit about how that process works. Uh, well, I pro applied with the first draft of the script um, in like uh, September of 2008 uh, and got into the the writers lab in January of 2009, and it's a it's an intensive process of of you you get feedback on the script basically you send the script in they uh, bring in a whole bunch of advisors and they're all sc uh, screenwriters who are very active in the industry uh, and almost all of them are very active in like independent films and and uh, art house films and so it's people that have a a connection to this that style of filmmaking it's not like you're getting sent you know the script is getting sent to people who wrote like you know Herbie 13 or something like that um, and it's fantastic. You you go to the, the the resort, the Sundance Resort, a beautiful place, and you have meetings with people, and they they go for like three or four hours. And these people, very smart, very talented people, just go through your script page by page by page, and they they give you detailed thoughts about it, and they're they're asking you questions about it. They're making you clarify what it is that you're trying to do with it. And by the end of it, your brain is just, it's just scrambled. It's compl you're just so exhausted and have so many voices going on. Uh, so you kind of have to take that and then decompress. What they say is that most people, they go back and they start writing and they write another draft and the draft that they write is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's just, you're so confused and you're, you're trying to incorporate so many things uh, that it just, it just doesn't work. But then from there, the next, uh, step of that is you start to go back to your vision, you start to really incorporate um, uh, what you've heard and the feedback you've gotten and the script gets stronger from that. Then the next stage is the the director's lab where you actually get to workshop the script. You, you put up uh, you know three or four scenes from the project uh, and you're working with advisors again and you know I was working with people like uh, you know like Ed Harris um, uh, Alfred Woodard was an advisor, Catherine Harris, um, and uh, uh, Joan, um, Joan Tewksbury, mm -hmm. who wrote Nashville, was an, uh, was an advisor, and like really like amazing people. Uh, and they're there helping you on set while you're workshopping these scenes, and so uh, it gives you a chance to, to just you know, work out problem areas of the script and, and gets you in the mode of like actually making it into something. So it's an incredibly valuable process. And then even beyond that, it, it's, it's valuable because it, it adds like a, a, an air of legitimacy to the project. You get to go to investors and say, you know, not only here's a script, which is good, here's a short film that it's based on, which is good, but we just went through the Sundance Lab. So it's a Sundance Lab script and people are like, oh, well, I, I wanna be involved in that. So it's, you know, I can't say enough about it. I, I really and and I really enjoy the 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 group of people that uh, that runs it the the Sundance Institute. It's a it's a bunch of really smart, very well connected people in the film industry who all they want to do is help you to make your film. It's and really it's, it's unique so to be able to have uh, yeah. to have a relationship with people like that who actually don't have an agenda. Yeah, they just want you to you know figure out what yeah. is best for your project. They've been super, super helpful for us. Now, what was the experience between now shooting on it with a feature crew as opposed to a short crew? Uh, it was intense. Many man. more sleds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And mm -hmm. people who, you know, were not used to Alaska adjusting to what the scenario was up there. Um, uh, I mean, we did have people and the from town Barrow and Anchorage on our crew too, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It was like an expedition. Yeah. Um, fraught with like, disasters every day that you have to, you know, just like, it was like yeah. always teetering on the edge of destruction. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Yeah. I think there were some crew members who were kind of traumatized by the end of it. <laughs> People were like, that was the most intense shoot of my life. Yeah. Uh, and they had done plenty of other indie movies. I mean, I think people had a good time. I hope they yeah. did anyways. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was hard. It was very, the, the conditions are hard. The, you know the the cold, the shooting on the ice, with the having to watch the 
the wind and make sure we didn't get blown out to sea. Waiting um, for the lead, that was really... Waiting for the lead, hoping we can find a, a, a place to shoot pivotal scenes. You know, had to have somebody on set watching for polar bears all the time. Um, we had a crew full of people that they, they didn't really know how to like drive snowmobiles or only a few of them did. And that's the only mode of transportation we had to or from set for a lot of the, the days of the shoot. Uh, then there's also the town itself. People in, in Barrow don't really know what a, a film crew might require. So we, you know, shooting at a location and we show up with 30 people and they're like, what, what is going on? <laughs> we thought it was going to be you and a camera and an actor. I'm like, nah, it doesn't work that way. Right. So there is a real learning curve from both sides, I think. Um, but we made it yeah, somehow. It, it was also great, you know, like yeah. uh, it was as painful as it was it's a fun process and, and you're doing it. The, the days yeah. that were actually the most painful were the days off because that's, it seemed like every time we had a day off, like the whole thing just almost completely fell apart. <laughs> I had to say that we had like, we had an exceptional crew. Like yeah. our crew was incredibly hardworking and really just like, you know, they gave 110% like constantly. So we really like, it's a credit to our crew that we were able to make it. It was a really great group of people. Mm -hmm. So now once you, went, uh, once you completed the film, uh, you started to look at, uh, into festivals again, because you'd already gone to Sundance with your thesis, and I can't remember, did you go before that as well? Yeah, I, I had a, a short doc uh, in the festival in 05. And so how is it now, because you've done the festivals as, as the as short, was it, how, was it a big difference now coming into it with a feature? Very yeah, different. It's night and day. Totally different. Yeah. yeah. Um, being in a sh there with a short is, it's so much fun. Uh, there's not a lot of expectations attached to it. There's only so much that can happen to you if you have a short there. And uh, so really, you're, you're there, you're showing the film, you're meeting people, you're meeting other filmmakers, you're going to other films, and you're just kind of having a really great, great time. With a feature, it's a business. And you're there to sell the film, you're there to, um, uh, to promote the film, to, to do press events, uh, and there's a whole different level of expectations involved. People are, um, different types of people are, are tuned in or paying attention and uh, it's, it's just a, ho a whole different world. It's, uh, it's not as much fun, I would say, just because you don't get that experience. I, I went and saw like maybe two other films while I was there and you're not really like there to meet other filmmakers or anything like that. You're there for a job and it, it definitely uh, has that sense. But it's still, you know, it's a great thing to do. It's a great festival to be at. and. Yeah. It's a good festival for filmmakers, I think. You know, they're, they support and they involve filmmakers in a good way. Um, so where's, uh, where's On the Ice taking you in the festival circuit this, uh, since, you, since you launched uh, the premiere at Sundance? It's been, We've been all over, yeah. yeah. We, we did our international premiere in Berlin, mm -hmm. which was so fun. And um, it's just a really cool city. And we lucked out and won some big awards there, so it made it even more fun. And then... We've been to, we went to yeah. Istanbul. We went to Saint Petersburg, Russia. We've been all over the U.S. Sydney, yeah. Australia. Yeah, that's the film has also played really in places like Busan and South Korea. We, we didn't get to, get to go. go, but yeah, we've been to festivals. You know, obviously all over North America. And for some of our filmmakers who are looking to possibly get involved in film festivals, is there any kind of like research or uh, that goes into choosing which festivals you think will be a, a good match? Well, it depends on what kind of film you have and what you're trying to do with it. If it's a short, then I think um, the stakes aren't quite as intense. You know, you can sort yeah. of choose where you think your film might fit well. Um, and if you're trying to get exposure, obviously, you know, the larger festivals get more exposure. But if you have a feature, then it's sort of a whole, it's a whole different conversation to figure out, you know, how you might be able to sell your film. Yeah. Now, last year you guys decided to take it to the next level and do self-distribution for the film. Now, didn't you, guys, you had a very successful Kickstarter campaign. Congratulations on that. Thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so you, so, everyone that yeah. helped us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what, what, was, uh, what was kind of the choice to self-distribute? Well, we, when we went to Sundance, we were offered some small offers from some smaller distributors to do a more traditional release. Um, 
but for what they were willing to give, we would sort of be giving the film away for a long time and maybe getting a two-city release and sort of giving away control of how the film was handled. And so because uh, Sundance and William Morris Endeavor were both working on these self-distribution contexts, uh, Sundance released the, um, launched their Artist Services Initiative, which is um, a structure through which Sundance filmmakers can do a self-release. And then William Morris Endeavor has this company called Self-Serve that also did a similar self-release thing for music, and they were wanting to transition it into filmmakers. So we were sort of one of their first self-serve projects. And so because both of those things were happening at the same time, um, our sales agent and uh, one of our producers said, you know, should we consider doing this ourselves with the help of Sundance and William Morris Endeavor, and we decided to do it. But that depended on us raising the money for distribution, and we ended up raising $80,000 through Kickstarter, but that is a very, very small amount of money to do what, what you need to do. Um, so it's been, it's been a real, really fascinating learning experience of how to take care of the film properly or as best we can for that amount of money. And yeah. so far, so good. I mean, how many cities are you planning to distribute to now? Well, we have committed to nine, um, but there are a bunch more that are that are possible. Um, the The issue is for those additional cities, we probably have no money to spend on advertising, and so if the theater is not cool with that, then they just won't take the film. Um, but some theaters who do like a calendar, like they kind of curate and they have their own like membership, they can, they can do that because they have their own advertising. So we're sort of trying to find the right theaters um, to match our, our film. So any new projects on the horizon now? There is. Too many. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of projects that, um, uh, that are in the early stages of development. You know, there's scripts that I'm writing and, and some films that have been approached to to write, and there's also films that I've been approached to direct. None of the films have funding yet, so I, I have no idea what the next film is going to be. I, mean, I should say I have an idea, but I just don't know which one's going to go. So I could be filming, uh, you know, in Florida. I could be filming in Texas. I could be filming in Alaska. I just don't know what it's going to be. Yeah, you sort of wait and see which one gets greenlit. Yeah. Now, are you looking or interested in doing? Projects that weren't that uh, that you haven't written stuff that's that's coming. To, are, you, are you getting projects that's coming from out from outside sources? Yeah, both. I mean, I'm getting. Uh, there's definitely scripts that are self-generated that I want to write uh, just based on my own uh, ideas. There's uh, some scripts that I've been approached to get involved with as both a writer and a director, and that's great. But then there's also films that uh, that they just approach me with a completed script and. They're looking to attach as a, uh, a director to, and I love that. I think that's that's awesome. I, I I love I love writing and directing, but then just to to be able to just come in and just focus on the directing, I think is something that I'd be very very happy to do. And they're different. Also, you know, there's different genres, different types of films. Some of them are very commercial. Uh, some of them, you know, very much not so. And so, I, I like to do. I'm hoping to be able to do a pretty broad spectrum of, uh, of films over the course of, the career, of my career. So we'll see what happens. Okay, well just one final question. Do, uh, to all of our aspiring filmmakers out here in Alaska, what, what kind of advice would you have for them for if they're looking to get started as, uh, in filmmaking? I think you just gotta do it. It's the, the technology has advanced to the point where you're able to, to make things no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what your circumstances are there's there's a possibility to make something and you learn so much by doing it that it's not like it's not like it, it's not really possible to waste your time in in that um, it's the challenge I think is is going from that stage to doing it on, on a more professional level and I think the the way that that happens is by meeting people, by networking. It's by cultivating a group of people that you can work with who can help you uh, take, take a project to the next level. 
And it doesn't mean that you have to go to film school. It doesn't mean that uh, you, know, you have to start working in the industry necessarily, but you have to make an effort to create a, an artistic community for yourself. And I think, that's, I think that's the strongest thing that anybody can do for their own, to, to further their own career, to further their own artistic um, expression. And Kara, what about anyone looking to be a producer? I mean, I think it's a similar thing. I think I, I learned about producing by doing and just take on projects. I think that produce, good producers are not the easiest thing to find, so it's not that hard to find directors who are looking for a producer to help them develop something. So I think if somebody wants to get into producing, they should make stuff, but also work for other producers that they respect so that they can see how other people you know, run a production or, or manage to get something developed and actually to completion. Um, I learned a lot from my main mentor um, and I think that uh, it's good to work through the stages so you understand what everybody's doing um, before you take something on just on your own. Well thank you both for, for joining us today and uh, we wish you all the, all the luck in your future endeavors. Thank yeah, you, thank thanks you. so much. That's all the time we have for today's episode of Alaska Filmmakers. For more information on Andrew, Kara, and their film on the ice, please visit our website at www.alaskafilmmakers.com. We'd like to thank Andrew, Kara, and the staff of the Rasmussen Foundation for their hospitality. As always, we'd like to thank our supporters and our sponsors for making this season of Alaska Filmmakers possible. Join us next week when we speak with Eric Leiser of IATSE Local 918. And until then, remember, everyone has a story to tell.